Okay, off we go, and it looks like it's recording. Yay, okay, all right. So, um, yeah, by the way, I, I did, I think I said this in the email, but I changed some of the settings in the computer's sound uh, settings deal. I don't know how that works. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that it's actually going to improve the audio quality. I, I feel like it may have. So anyway, uh, I, I'm happy to receive feedback on if you find it harder to hear or easier to hear or whatever. Okay. All right. So uh, what we uh, what I left as uh, you know uh, uh, you know for y'all to read on your own. And again, reminder: this is an unfortunate aspect of this course that there's too much material for the time available, and so I'm going to have to do that on a fairly regular basis. Um, but uh, so in particular, I suggested that y'all read this part on your own. And uh, the big idea is to build up to this idea of invertibility. Uh, this is an uh, th- uh, among the other three before it, this is a an abstract representation of a function where we have uh, points, three points in this domain, and then uh, there are four points in this target. And the, what the function does is it takes, for example, this point in the domain and it sends it to this point in the target. Uh, so again, just a kind of a figurative sort of thing. So I claim this is what we would call an invertible function uh, because as I have this drawn, oh, and let me get into the full screen mode. Uh, as we have this drawn, uh, notice that the action, uh, let me go into pencil mode. The action of this function doing those things, I can just turn that around backwards. Right? And I could talk about, well, if I undo if the uh, what went in to produce outs, you turn it around. What had come out are now the inputs, and what comes out is now going to be uh, the outputs of were what they were originally the inputs. We're going to just turn everything backwards. Then the new function just goes like that. No problem. Easy to define an inverse function, and very importantly, you need certain conditions for this to actually make sense, right? So for example, if I try to invert this function, (laughs) you can't do that. It doesn't give you a function, right? I just, um, where would this point go? There is no arrow going to it for me to turn around. It has no pre-images. I can't, uh, I just, I'm, I'm dead in the water, right? Uh, likewise, uh, in a different way, I've got a problem with this point. If I turn all these arrows around backwards, that would kind of suggest that I'm going to be going to both of these points. That's not what functions do. A function has to give for every input, keep in mind the right side is our input as we invert, as we try to invert. For every input, I need to have exactly not approximately, exactly one output. I got too many to choose from here. So anyway, this is why we care about, uh, at least in this context, uh, that we care about injectivity and subject, surjectivity, uh, not subjectivity, (laughs) Uh, because uh, between the two of them, they give us invertibility. So let's look at uh, this uh, example here. And um, <clears throat> here's an innocent looking function. Yeah, it's not invertible. A lot of people mistakenly think that this function's invertible. But isn't the inverse of this function the square root? Like the opposite of squaring is the square root, right? And kind of, sort of, but not really, and certainly not for this function right here. Because if you look at the following point in the target, right, you look at nine there in the target, What's the uh, pre-image? Uh, how, what is the number? What is the real number that squares to make nine? Well, there's two of them. What, are we supposed to just pick based on our mood? Right? Uh, that's no good. Uh, you can't do that in math. Um, arguably worse. What about um, negative 16? Right? What do I do with uh, with that point? There is no real number that squares to produce negative 16. So this function is just straight up not invertible. Uh, but if you're careful with the domain and the target, and you'll notice here uh, what I've uh, done to uh, fix this function, and a lot of people would sloppily say, well, they're kind of the same function. Look, they've got the same formula. Oh, no, 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 they're not the same function. This one I have circled in green now is invertible. 
because uh, if I were to consider, for example, 9 in that target and ask where is the inverse, what is the, you know, what is the pre-image of 9 through G? Well, it's 3. What about negative 3? That's not on the, that's not an option. Right? There's unambiguously no problem, only 3 in the original domain that lands on 9. What about negative 16? Uh, you know, if I have, uh, if I put negative 16 here, uh, oh wait, I'm not even allowed to put negative 16 there. Only non-negative numbers are allowed. Right, so problem solved. And so this is why we have to care so much about domains and targets, uh, because this business here, not choosing those, but instead choosing those is what makes this function not invertible but this one here, seemingly same formula, invertible. Okay. All right. Another quick example, which I do largely because uh, I feel like this is something that's uh, under uh, presented, under considered in high school trig classes, is let's talk about how to invert the sine function. And again, you have to be careful with the domain and the target. If you were to look at just this formula and you know not worry about the domain and the target, well, that function oscillates a lot and it's not invertible it's, right it's just not I mean uh, for this output value there's lots of different angles right that uh, could be presumably seemingly the value of arc signs and you can't just pick right so uh, you're going to make all these problems go away of course by restricting your domain and target Accordingly, as I have uh, indicated here, and notice uh, these values of theta and these values of of uh, now y, I guess we'll call it. Um, those correspond very nicely, one to one, on to. For every green, there's a blue. For every blue, there's a green. The perfect pairing, perfect correspondence. Everybody's got a buddy, right? Like this. Uh, and uh, that function is invertible, and the inverse of this function is called arc sine. So now again, you can think of sine as something that does, as I've indicated in the purple there, um, on uh, using sort of the graph of the sine function. Um, this is a common way to think about functions. It's a common way to think about sine in particular. And for a lot of functions, yeah, it's the most geometrically satisfying, it's the most convenient way to think about a lot of functions is to look at their graphs. Very importantly, not all functions, right? Graphs are a tool. They're just a tool in your toolbox. Don't feel like you have to uh, use them or don't feel like that they are intrinsically what a function is. They're just a tool in your toolbox. I personally, and I think this makes loads of sense, I would much rather think about the unit circle, theta tells me where I am on the unit circle, sine theta tells me the y coordinate, and I much prefer to think of sine, certainly in a situation like this, that's just going uh, just like that. It just gets you from the unit circle to the corresponding part of the y axis. And then it's a lot easier to understand what arc sine is. Arc sine going the opposite direction is just that. And uh, fine, you can do that on the graph too, but when you do this, people feel this compulsion to, oh, wait a second, but if I'm, if I'm thinking about the Y as the input, then don't I have to kind of flip it over? Isn't the input supposed to be horizontal? Isn't the output supposed to be the vertical axis? And uh, people get all confused and they want to switch uh, the inputs and the outputs. And, oh my gosh, it is so much confusion and so much un unnecessary confusion is the point. Right, um, sine is just a natural correspondence, as I'm as I'm viewing on the right over here, uh, between uh, points on the unit circle and points on the relevant part of the y-axis. One way, other way, real simple. Okay, all right. 
Okay, uh, likewise for other trig functions. A reminder, I'm going to assume y'all are all experts in trig, and uh, this is the kind of thing that I'm going to assume that you're all experts in, um, and uh, if you feel like you might be a little shaky on this, and I, I imagine it's probably quite a few of you, um, then uh, yeah, you just want to make sure to bone up on this. And uh, a good exercise would be to try to produce a point of view uh, on this sort of thing for cosine. Or what's the analog of this for cosine? How does that change things? How's that going to change the domain, for example? Right, what's the corresponding picture? Um, I will point out that if you try to do something like this for secant um, or uh, cotangent or something like that, the unit circle point of view is not as helpful for those you probably want to look at the graph. All right, a little bit of lingo I'm going to mostly wave my hands at and let y'all read for yourselves. Um, there's a lot of terminology that we use to describe different kinds of functions that have uh, possibly several inputs and possibly several outputs. Uh, so uh, make sure to look through all of this. Uh, one quickie observation I'll make is that this word, uh, this suffix here, valued, uh, it's just a reference to what comes out of the function. So if you say vector valued, that eh, just means that what comes out of the function are vectors, namely multiple uh, uh, coordinates. Um, and then likewise, variable is a suffix that just refers to what goes in. Right? Vector variable or multivariable uh, just says that there's several input variables. All right, and there's a little comment down here about component functions. That's a pretty straight read, I think. Make sure you look at this. Uh, a quickie example of what sounds like a very scary mathematical construction, a vector-valued multivariable function, sounds very abstract and, and uh, you know, uh, sophisticated, and uh, I suppose maybe, you know, in some ways, right? But I just like to point out they're everywhere. Um, the most trivial of water cooler conversations, right? Talking about the weather. You're technically talking about a vector valued multivariable function because uh, there's a lot of inputs that go into identifying the weather. I got to know where you are uh, and uh, when you're talking about and are you on the ground or are you up in the air on an airplane? Makes you, all these things make a big difference on the weather. And then there's several aspects of the weather, namely several variables that are functions of those inputs. Uh, so it uh, doesn't feel like it, but you are very often talking about <laughs> vector-valued multivariable functions. Um, and uh, so point being, uh, these are extremely broadly applicable in the real world. It's just endless how many different ways you can take what we're going to be learning about vector-valued multivariable functions or, or scalar-valued multivariable functions or what have you and how they can apply uh, in the real world. Okay, so let's talk about how to visualize these things. I'm going to start with the one that everybody starts with, and that is a graph. Uh, let's come down here real quick first. Look at this example. Actually, I'm going to make a different color choice here. Um, so looking at this example right here, um, <clears throat> we've got a function with one input and one output. Uh, the input is going to be called x. So the domain represents possible values of x. And uh, then that's going to go into the function and produce an output, which I'm going to call y momentarily, right? And y'all are accustomed to this idea that we take the input, make that the first coordinate uh, of a point. We take the output, we make that the second coordinate of a point. And even though... The domain is one-dimensional, the target is one-dimensional, everything that you can write down about this function is one-dimensional. After all, we call this a single variable function, right? Nevertheless, we're making points here now that are points in the plane, points in a two-dimensional world. So that's not because there's anything about the function that's intrinsically two-dimensional, it's because we are choosing to create a picture in this certain way where we arbitrarily, just because we feel like it, chose 
<laughs> right? To uh, take input values and output variables, uh, output values, and kind of smash them together. I would say kind of unnaturally, right? Arbitrarily. Uh, like this to produce uh, these points. And if you, of course, you do this for all the inputs, then you get a curve that we call the graph of the function. So uh, old news, you all have seen all that before, but I wanted to establish the language and I want to establish uh, also what is the pattern uh, by which we form graphs. And then I'm just going to point out that uh, we can follow this analog. Uh, okay, uh, and you know, based on what we just looked at, we can say, all right, well, if, if instead of having one input, if you have several inputs, you can kind of put them all down there. And if instead of one output, you have several outputs, you can kind of put them all together. And it's just, again, just kind of mimicking what we did here to produce points on a graph curve. This produces points on a graph in n plus m dimensional space, whatever that is, right? But that's the kind of point that we get. And the graph in general of a vector valued multivariable function is a pretty hard thing to draw a picture of. And most of the time we just won't because we can't because it's too high dimensional. Nevertheless, that's the, that's the pattern, that's the construction. Now, uh, I'm going to give you a different point of view on how to form a graph uh, that uh, for kind of, you know, rubber meets the road purposes in practice, how do we actually do business is uh, more common. Uh, that goes as follows. Uh, we take what comes out of the function. We take the formula, for example, the rule of assignment, but uh, let's think of it as the formula here what we're going to be doing in both, most cases. Um, and then we arbitrarily, because we feel like it, choose to give the values a name. So I'm going to choose here to take the values that come out of f, you know, f of x. I'm going to choose to call those y. I'm going to set, you might say, the output values equal to y. Um, this action of setting the values of a function equal to a new variable gives you an equation which forms the graph. And so again, you get a curve like that. Right, so just again, you know, this is not something you have any obligation to do just because you have a function, right? You have a function and, uh, you know, x is what you call the input to that function. What comes out is called f of x. End of story. You don't have to bring up y. There's no need for the name y. x goes in, f of x comes out. That's what a function is. You are choosing to call the outputs y, and that choice to call the outputs y is what creates the graph. Okay, so uh, let's take those points of view. Whoopsie, let's take those points of view and apply them now to our first multivariable function. Reminder multiple input variables. So this is a function of two variables, aka a multivariable function. And <clears throat> okay, right. So uh, let's let's do it. Uh, here's our here's our domain, which I'm going to loosely represent in this picture over here is the xy plane. Uh, the uh, coordinates of an input point are x and y. I put those first. Uh, what comes out is a single value that I'm going to call z. I'm going to represent with the z-axis as being kind of, yeah, that's representative of sort of the target, uh, if you will. And uh, so I'm going to take that output value, namely how far do I go up there. I'm going to call that z, putting it next. Notice that then gives me points with three coordinates. What's up with this three business? The domain's not three-dimensional. Target's not three-dimensional. I made up a three-dimensional space by smashing together, in some sense, the domain and the target, right? Arbitrarily, because I feel like it, I didn't have to, that's my choice, and that constructs, uh, two seconds, uh, that constructs points like this, and if you do this for every point in the domain, you will produce then a surface 
called the graph. Yeah. Can you say that the graph is a function from R2 to R3? No, it's just not. Okay. Uh, no, so so very importantly, you, now you can make a different function, but that would that would be a different function. And um, uh, let's see here. There, there uh, how to say this? Uh, it, that would be a parameterization of the graph of our function. Yeah. Um, so it's that would be a. a, a um, that's an unnecessary thing to do. I'll say that. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So very importantly, the domain is two dimensional. The target is one dimensional. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, taking the other point of view, uh, our other point of view was to take the formula for the function, namely what comes out of the function. Here's our formula for the output values uh, of the of this function f. Right, and we can then choose to call those output values z. Then they have to do that. I'm choosing to give them a name. I'm choosing to set f uh, output values equal to z. That act creates an equation that is the graph. That's the equation of this surface. This surface is the graph of that function. So different point of view, different way to think about it in practice. That's kind of how this tends to go down. Okay. All righty. <clears throat> okay, so now I, I, everybody likes graphs. Uh, when you're doing single variable calculus, this is practically every picture you draw in a single variable calculus course is a picture kind of like this. Right? It's super useful. Um, hard to beat it. So many nice uh, geometric conveniences. If you want to understand calculus, single variable calculus, there's the picture, the curve, this geometric object that is the curve, that is the graph of the function. Um, its geometric features, namely the slope or the concavity, depending on which way it goes, those are cues to the algebra of the function, namely calculus, namely the, the derivative or the second derivative, stuff like that, right? Fantastic visual aid in single variable calculus. Big fan. Here's the problem. Great though that is in single variable calculus. Look what happens when you push even just a little bit in the multivariable direction. I have here now a mere three input variables. Just three, not even that many, right? Uh, and uh, then uh, the lowest possible, you know, one output variable, and well, <laughs> uh, three input variables followed by one output variable makes uh, my graph have four coordinates. That means my picture would be four dimensional. My equation that I get to describe the graph is an equation of four variables. The result, you know, what that equation represents is a picture in four dimensions, and I can't do that. Right? <laughs> so, crash and burn. Just, I mean, not doable. It's a non-starter. You can't even draw the picture. So we can talk about the graph, I suppose. We just can't draw it. And in some sense, uh, isn't that the whole purpose of having a picture in the first place? Right? So graphs have very limited use in a multivariable context. Pretty much this is, uh, I don't want to say the only, only one, but, oh, man, this very limited, the, right, the, the least um, possible variables in a multivariable function. Only the simplest possible case of a multivariable function can be represented with a graph. None of the others can. At least not that you can draw. Yes? Are there any rules regarding like the domain being bigger than the codomain? Nope. Or nope. Not, yeah, that's arbitrary. Yeah. A parameterization, for example, has one input, but several outputs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, uh, no such rule, and there's some weird cases. Yeah, so you could, you can talk about a, a single variable function that has two outputs, and you could technically talk about the graph of a function like this. It'd be weird, though, and I'm not sure why anyone would want to draw the graph of a function that really much 
would be much better visualized by viewing it as a parameterization. Yeah. Yeah, totally. All right. Okay, so first important uh, thing I want to uh, point out, um, it is very common because of how single variable calculus goes down to view a graph of a function as being, eh, you know, pretty much synonymous with the function itself. And that's a big mistake, all right? Now, that's training that we implicitly got from our single variable calculus courses. They don't draw any pictures other than graphs. Why would you, why not conflate the function with the graph? If that's the only picture you're ever going to use, I kind of get it, right? So I'm not blaming uh, uh, single variable calculus courses. Uh, but at this point, you really cannot afford to do that. We're going to be drawing uh, other kinds of pictures, to fill in for this big loss right here, to help us visualize different kinds of multivariable functions, um, and you got you have to be prepared not only to see those other kinds of pictures, but to recognize those other kinds of pictures as not being graphs, because you can't interpret them like graphs because they aren't graphs, and everything changes how calculus looks in all these other kinds of pictures. Totally different. And we're going to see some examples of that in a couple of minutes. Okay, so um, <clears throat> here's another example. I think this is an easy sort of foot in the door for uh, seeing these other kinds of pictures. Uh, here we're going to talk about this uh, function from R3 to R1. And, of course, what a function does is a function takes points out of the domain and puts them in to the target. Right. So let's just draw that. Here's my domain. My domain is R3. Boom, that's what R3 looks like. Just literally, that's the best I can do to draw R3. I guess, uh, you know, I have to confess I'm faking it a little bit there, right? This is not actually a three-dimensional picture, right? It's, it's flat. The screen is totally flat, right? Um, and, but I have used the artistic trickery to make it look, to help you visualize it, right, as being three-dimensional. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, you got to best you can in a difficult situation. Um, and now uh, my target is R1. Okay, I, there's the real number line, R1. I can draw that too, and I can represent that what this function is doing is taking stuff out of R3 and plopping it down into R1. So this is what I like to call the literal picture. Um, I may have made up that term. I'm not sure. But uh, that said, this picture, this kind of picture gets used a lot. It's extremely natural. You're going to see this all over the place, not just in my class. Um, so uh, heads up about that. And very importantly, also about this picture, not a graph. Right? This is not. I did not set W equal to uh, F of X, Y, Z in any way that's represented in this picture. <laughs> right? Uh, the graph would have to be four-dimensional. We already agreed that I can't even begin to draw that. Very importantly, this is not a graph. Now let's ask the next question. Do we like this literal picture? What I'm calling this literal picture. Uh, is, this, is this a good thing? Do we, is this a helpful kind of a picture? And it's tempting to say no. Where's the curve? Where's the surface? Where's a shape? I need some sort of a shape. What have I learned from this picture? How does this help me understand the nature of what F is doing? How does this help me get my hands on uh, understanding it in any way? How does this help me relate it to applications that I might be? It doesn't look like there's much to see. Here. It's very disappointing at a glance. Um, and I have two responses to that complaint. Uh, one is, okay, so uh, would you rather this one? Because this is literally no picture at all, <laughs> right? So this is a beggars and choosers kind of situation. Um, there, there, there are no other options <laughs> available to us for what to draw. So... Um, in the absence of better options, at least it's something. 
So that's my first answer. Uh, my second answer, hopefully it'll be more persuasive, uh, but uh, my second answer is that this is actually a pretty great way to represent certain kinds of things. So for example, um, we talked on the first day of class about this idea of, you know, a multivariable derivative in some sense is supposed to help me understand how when I, uh, if I'm in some sort of a uh, context, but I'm moving and I want to keep track of, for example, of how temperature is changing. Well, here's how you can use this kind of a picture to do that. Um, have your function represent temperature, for example. And at this point A, perhaps, the temperature at that point is some value. And now I can very reasonably ask, I think it's a perfectly reasonable question, suppose while I am at this point A that I take off and start moving with some velocity, V. Perfectly reasonable. How would I represent motion in my domain? Well, I, we represent motion with a velocity vector because vectors represent a direction and a magnitude, in this case speed. So that's a natural, perfectly reasonable way to represent my motion in the domain. And then I can further say, okay, well, yeah, but as I do that, the temperature is going to start changing at some rate as well. And I can represent the rate that the temperature changes by a vector over here in R1. And this doesn't really quite help me answer the question, but it does a fantastic job of helping me geometrically represent the question itself. I'm at that point moving with that velocity. At that point, there was a certain temperature, and of course, as I move in the input, that's going to make the, the output move as well. And I've, I've got a picture of all my objects that I care about in the question. And that's something. Is that cool? All right. Okay, so uh, here's another way to represent functions with pictures that isn't a graph, and that is to draw something called level sets. Now, again, I have a sort of a formal way of writing it right there, and we don't need to focus on that. Uh, in practice, uh, I think it's a lot easier to understand level sets with uh, an example. The idea of a level set is set an output value, for example, 1, arbitrarily, and then ask, what do, you, what do you get when you set the function equal to that constant fixed output value? So if I were to take uh, my function here, f of x equals x squared, if I were to set my function equal to 1, what do I get? Okay, well, uh, you know, what I get is this equation, which I understand, that is the equation of a circle, and that circle is the collection of points that when you plug into the function, all give you this same output value of 1. Is that cool? Now that's just one point in the output in the target, right? But I have a curve in the domain that has the feature very relevant to the function itself. Those are all the points where the value of the function is exactly one. Okay, uh, <clears throat> and I can do that for other points as well. For example, I could take two. Let me get rid of all the mess there. I can take 2. Let's see what happens when I set the value of the function equal to 2. Uh, again, the values of the function are x squared plus y squared. When I set that function equal to 2, that gives me this equation, which again I recognize. That's another circle. It's a little bit larger circle, like so. That's another level set. And I can keep going. Right? I can take a bunch of different values uh, in the target, look at the corresponding um, pre-images, right? Right? inputs that land on the prescribed outputs. So uh, for every output, there's a corresponding pre-image, and altogether these are the level sets of my function. 
So that's a kind of a picture. By the way, let's talk terminology. Uh, why do I refer to, for example, uh, let me get rid of uh, this, like so. Um, why do I uh, refer to this as F inverse of 1? Well, the, that's because I'm going to take 1 here, and I'm going to look at what I get, all the different points that I get by, if, if you will, kind of moving backwards through the function, right? I get all of those points. Those are all the points that going forward through the function land on 1. So going backwards, if you will, it's not invertible, of course, right? But uh, interpreting uh, going backwards uh, makes f inverse, I think, a pretty reasonable notation. So uh, this is a bit of a notation crime, just a little bit. Right? Uh, you will notice that it kind of looks here like, I've, like I'm describing f inverse as being a function. It's not a function. f is not invertible, certainly not the one that I have written here. Right? So uh, yeah, it's an abuse, a little bit. But uh, we're, we're aware that that's not actually a function, and that's okay. And it's so uh, we're just going to kind of broaden the use of that notation to, uh, in this way, to represent things that aren't actually invertible functions. Anyway, everybody okay with that? Okay. Okie dokie. So uh, seems like a weird way to represent functions. Here's the good news. You've already seen this kind of stuff probably in some contexts. Um, so, for example, if you've ever gone on a hike or if you've ever looked at it for whatever reason, look at a uh, contour map, they sometimes call them. By the way, they have them on Google Maps, right? Uh, at a certain zoom level, if you select, I think you select terrain as one of the view options, and they will pop up lines that look kind of like this. Um, so the big idea is, for example, maybe this curve right here represents where the altitude is, oh, let's say 400 feet. Uh, above sea level. Okay, so if that's 400 feet, all right, then that's a certain value of the altitude function. All right, so at any given point on the surface of the Earth, there's a corresponding altitude. That green line is a level set because it's a pre-image, because it's what you get when you look at a fixed value on the right and ask what are the corresponding inputs on the left. Uh, then uh, likewise, maybe this here represents, let's say, 500 feet. Okay, a little bit further along. And then uh, maybe this one represents 600 feet, a little bit further along. We've got a bunch of level sets here. So all topographical maps are level sets. Um, <clears throat> so uh, now, what good is this? Is this useful in any way? I emphasize it's not a graph. Definitely not a graph. The slopes of those lines do not tell you anything about like a derivative of altitude. No, not at all. Totally different picture. Totally different calculus for these pictures. And by the way, it's going to be a while before we get to actually having enough multivariable calculus tools to really be able to talk about the calculus of level sets. But we will get there in time. Um, so uh, <clears throat> this is not a perfect picture, but nevertheless, I, I, I hope you can kind of see that uh, here we have uh, 500 feet and then 600 feet and then 700 feet. Can't you kind of sort of see sort of a hill sort of right there? You know what I mean? That's actually kind of helpful. So this is helping me understand a three-dimensional scenario, right? If, if you think about it, the graph of this function is the mountain itself. Right. But this level set is two-dimensional. Right. Again, something I can fit onto a piece of paper. I can fold it up and put it in my backpack and uh, go for a hike. And I've got a very accurate description of a sort of how uh, altitude is changing as I proceed on my hike. Uh, just for fun, uh, I pulled an actual topographical map. Uh, this is from a, uh, a mountain in Colorado that I uh, hiked when I was young and foolish. 
Uh, <laughs> in retrospect, it was a really dangerous thing. I'm pretty sure I'll never do it again. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's uh, it's a heck of a hike. If you're looking for a challenge uh, and uh, go in fully warned of the dangers, uh, this is a fantastic, uh, fantastic hike. Uh, so uh, anyway, a couple interesting things to see. Um, you'll notice that in some places uh, the... Uh, the level sets, aka contour lines, are not very close together. That means it's not very steep right there, right? Whereas in other places, the contour lines are very close together. Uh, that's really steep right there. Like that's that's so steep there that looks vertical. Like if you're looking over the edge, looking down, you'd be like, oh my god, that's straight down. Super steep. Right? So you can tell just by how close the lines are. How steep it is. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, let me zoom in on this part right here. Uh, when you're on this part of the hike, following that part of the trail, it's not super steep there. That's a noticeably uphill. No doubt about it. That's uphill, right? But it's it's not that steep because check it out. Um, it takes a quite a vertical distance to go from this contour line to that contour line. By the way, on this map, the contour lines are 40 feet in elevation apart from each other. And so it takes a great horizontal distance to gain 40 feet of altitude. So, not that steep. But if I were instead to, uh, let's see here, if I were to plot myself down on the map uh, right there, and if I were to go to right there, that also is 40 feet of elevation gain over a much shorter distance. That's really steep. Like, nobody wants to, I mean, there's a few hardcore heroes, you know, extremists kind of, you know, uh, people that maybe would want to do that, uh, but not me. Uh, so you'll notice the way around stuff like that is uh, what they do is instead of making you hike uphill like this, uh, they do these things called switchbacks. And so switchbacks means that uh, I'm going to go not directly uphill, but off at some sort of an angle. <coughs> and there I gain the same 40 feet of altitude, but I do it over a longer distance, and so it doesn't feel as steep. And it's more sort of tolerable. Uh, and in order to make that work, of course, you're going to go completely in the wrong direction unless you zigzag your way around. And so you're going to see uh, on the picture here, there's a lot of zigging and zagging. Right, and so you know, effectively, we're going almost straight uphill, but we're doing it um, in a way that's longer but not as steep. So, so you can see these maps are actually really useful. Level sets are great for, uh, <clears throat> in some sense, getting a visual intuition of what the altitude looks like on a two-dimensional picture. And uh, so again, <laughs> you know, you look at uh, again just for the humor value. Um, I'm claiming that is very steep. So now imagine how steep that is. That's just bonkers. I, I think it's like 75 degrees or 80 degrees. Or it's just it's just straight down. <laughs> if you fell off of there, you would not stop bouncing for a thousand feet of vertical. It's it's pretty legit. <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, that's a uh, uh, an application of level sets. Uh, a few more things to say about level sets. Um, <clears throat> turns out there's a relationship between graphs and level sets. They are not the same thing. But I'm going to make the modest observation that for uh, this kind of a function, two inputs, one output, if I make the graph and then if I take what I'm going to call a horizontal cross-section of the graph, now let's think about this right here, z equals a constant, that's the plane, that's a horizontal plane where height z is just some whatever value c. Um, if I look at these two things together, Namely, construct the graph and then take a horizontal cross-section of it. 
I mean, all together, what you get is that f of x is, in effect, just going to be equal to c. Well, that's exactly what a level set is. I, same resulting equation. f is morally just equal to c. So what we get then is the following, uh, again, sort of geometric example, um, <clears throat> where, uh, let's see, I can do this again. That little bit. Um, I get a relationship between level sets and graphs. So again, step one, let's form the graph. Oh, we're looking at this function right here. For that function, here's the graph. Again, this is what graph means. Graph means I set the values of the function equal to a new variable, in this case, z. We're going to momentarily, oh gosh, we're going to momentarily see that that graph looks like this it's kind of a it's kind of a parabolic shaped bowl we'll talk about that later so there's the graph now i'm going to take a horizontal cross section of that graph uh, or maybe i'll even take various horizontal cross sections whatever different values of c will give you different cross sections and you can see of course that those horizontal cross sections of that bowl are circles. And notice those are exactly the same circles that you would have gotten had you taken a level set. Keep in mind what a level set is. Level set says you're going to take set the value of the function equal to various constants. If you had formed level sets, you would get those exact same circles. So neat relationship. Graphs and level sets are totally different. And by the way, let's get uh, rid of the cross-section business on the picture here. Um, right, for that function in purple, uh, let me get rid of the, or how, how about I do this? I'll, I'll circle that. Um, the level set, you know what? I'm going to do one slide, sorry, just to be consistent. There we go. The level sets of that function are there in dark blue. The graph of the function is there in green. I cannot emphasize enough. Those are completely different pictures formed by completely different constructions, which in their completely different ways help me understand the exact same function. Um, so they are very different. But they are related by this business with horizontal cross sections. It's a really cool fact to, to have in your in your toolbox. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so here's a, an example. This is one of my favorite examples. Uh, it's um, uh, a great example of uh, this point that I make up at the top of the page that uh, there are different ways to understand functions geometrically. Okay. We can form the graph of the function. We can form a level set of the function. We can um, view the function as a parameterization of something, in some cases anyway. Um, and how very important it's going to be not to accidentally conflate these different things. So uh, here's the example. Uh, <clears throat> we will look at uh, the following line here. Um, certain line here. I've given some geometric specifics uh, to help you see what line we're talking about. I'll even throw in there's the equation of the line. Uh, oh, another important note. Another uh, math crime that happens rampantly in high school, certainly in my high school, and that is to conflate functions and equations. They are different critters. A function is a trio consisting of a domain and a target and then a basically a formula, right? A, a function is uh, an action. Something happens. Something goes in. Something comes out. That's what a function is, right? An equation is a statement. The statement may be about functions, possibly, possibly not. But it's just a statement that two things happen to be equal to each other. And these are not the same critters, right? So again, very important. Don't conflate equations with functions. 
Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we're interested in this line for some practical purposes, and uh, I would like to study this line by uh, by relating it to a function or maybe different functions, and then hopefully I can use the calculus of these functions to infer some geometric features of this line, perhaps. Right. So what function? Well, it depends. Are you talking about graphs, or are you talking about... Uh, level sets, or are we going to be doing the calculus of parameterizations? Are we going to be doing the calculus of level sets, calculus of graphs? Those are all different kinds of calculuses, and they are, are going to apply to this line by way of different functions. So let's uh, think through. I'm going to start with the easy one here. The easy one is uh, this function g. Um, I claim that this function g relates to that picture in a certain way in that this picture, L, is a level set of that function. Now, let's, again, let's be careful about this. How do I know that this is a level set? Well, because if I set this function equal to a particular constant, 6 in this case, and remember, the action of setting a function equal to a constant, that's what means you're making a level set. Uh, check it out. You get the exact same equation, and therefore that level set is that line. So this line is a level set of this light blue function G. Okay. All right, now, um, yeah, okay, but... What if I don't like level sets? What if I don't want to view this as a level set? What if I want to view this as being a graph of something? Can I view this line as being a graph that would allow me then to use the calculus of graphs? Ah, uh, why, yes, you can. Uh, I claim this function. Uh, the graph of this function is that line. Now, let's, again, be very careful. It's, uh, the, the word of the day here is careful. Notice that the algebra involved here. There's no tricky algebra. I'm not doing complex, sophisticated calculations here. That's not what makes this challenging. You gotta follow the rules precisely. You gotta use the language precisely and carefully. That's what makes all this challenging. Okay, so let's talk about this function. I claim the graph of this function is that line. Okay, how do I form a graph? Well, I have here a, uh, a function of one variable. That one variable is x. Uh, if I want to form the graph, I can do so by setting this function's values equal to a new variable. I'm going to choose y. The act of setting a function equal to a new variable gives me a graph. And now let's ask, what is this equation? Well, you can do a little algebra, and I encourage you to do this, but it gives you an equation that is exactly equivalent to that original equation, namely that graph of the green function is the same line L. All right, so then uh, I'll see the last example real quick. Oh, uh, 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 question, real, real quick. Uh, how did I, how did I come up with this function? Where did, I, where, where did I pull that out of thin air? Right? How do I know that that's the function to pick? Well, the argument is that uh, I know that whatever function this is, I'm going to be setting it equal to y. I know that that's supposed to result in an equation. That's equivalent to this equation. So a way to think about this is that I am solving for y in that original equation. If you can solve for y, you turn the original equation into this lower equation here. Having solved for y, I can view that equals y as then being how I construct the graph of uh, that function that I then infer on the left. Everybody buy it? Okay. All right. Cool. Okay, let's see here. Uh, last version. Uh, I claim that this function right here is relevant to this line. Uh, again, I emphasize the line. It's not the graph of this function. 
It's not a level set of this function. This function parameterizes the line. The grammar is a little bit different. It just has the, the, the English language, right? <laughs> English language says that's a shortcoming. So the grammar is a little bit uh, awkward there. But uh, the relationship between this function and that line is that it is a parameterization. And uh, again, not hard to see. And I'll let y'all think through the uh, the process here. Uh, roughly speaking, what I did here is I used this point to make that two, and then I used this vector uh, to multiply by t and add in the usual parameterization business. So y'all can fill in those those uh, those details. Make sure you can do that. Okay. So uh, we have here three different functions, and <clears throat> if uh, if you want to understand this line. You want to understand the geometry of that line, and if you want to use the calculus of graphs, okay, cool. You can use this function, apply the calculus of graphs to that function, because our line is the graph of that function. On the other hand, if you want to use the calculus of level sets, which we don't know yet, right? But we will, and when we once we've learned the calculus of level sets, if you want to use those tools to understand this line, well, you better not use that function. The line's not a level set of that function. That would give you garbage, meaningless nonsense. Right? So if you want to use the calculus of level sets, you've got to be able to identify to then subsequently use the function whose level sets, or a function whose level sets give you that line, uh, et cetera. So be really, really careful uh, with this kind of business. Again, notice uh, the out the actual mechanics of the algebra uh, to produce these functions is not hard. That's easy algebra, easy geometry, I suppose. Right? Um, this quest, this kind of question is not hard because of complexity. It's hard because of the need for careful precision with the terminology and the processes. And that's what makes these really tricky. And a lot of students get this wrong. You'd be surprised how many students will absolutely blow questions like this. <laughs> Just crash and burn nonsense wrong answers. Yeah, you've had your hand up. So the diagram could represent all three functions. Yeah, that's right. This that's right. This line relates to each of these functions in different ways. Uh, as a graph of that function, as a level set of that function, and as a, uh, uh, as a, you know, by way of parameterization, that function. Yeah, totally. So all, three different functions, three different interpretations, all representing the same line. Yeah, did you have a, yeah? Yes. Um, how did you get the uh, Oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm leaving that as an exercise for y'all. So the the, but the 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 broad stroke though is that uh, I claim if you interpret uh, that point and that direction vector, remember you can parameterize with a point and a parallel vector, right? And so that green point will give rise to that two, and that blue vector will give rise to this three and minus two. And I'm going to let y'all fill in the yeah blanks. Yeah. Um, so for the level set, we can come up with an equation that that line is a level set of, but we can't be certain that's the equation represented, right? Oh, uh, well, it, I mean, no, there's, so you, there's a certain amount of flexibility. So, for example, uh, I could look at, I could set this equal to various different constants, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not saying every level set of this function is that line, certainly not. Mm -hmm. But a specific particular level set of that function is that line. So you just have to make sure to, you know, you look at the equation in question and you just make sure to make the right choice. Okay, but other yeah. equations could also make that. Yes, that's correct. That's right. So so uh, here's uh, one thing that, you know, some people like to do this uh, and say minus 6 and then set that equal to 0. And so, well, we are looking at a level set now of this function, totally different function, totally different level set of that totally different function, but of course morally, uh, altogether this equation is still equivalent to that equation. I've just kind of moved things around. Right. Yep, totally. Totally. Okay. A um, <clears throat> couple of, let's see, how am I doing on time, by the way? Okay. A um, couple of neat little observations. 
this algebra right here, oh, whoops, wrong color, sorry. Uh, this algebra right here is surprisingly powerful. Now let's just take a moment first to be underwhelmed, <laughs> right, by that algebra. All I did is I took the right-hand side and I subtracted it over to the left. Hardly nothing happened there. Why am I impressed with this algebra, <laughs> right? So what's nice about this algebra is it allows me to reinterpret a graph as being a level set of something else. This allows me to take, like if I, if I, if I start with an understanding of my surface as being a graph of something, but if I want to use the calculus of level sets, because maybe the calculus of level sets is exactly what I need. Again, we'll learn all that calculus of level sets later. Um, if I want to take something viewed as a graph and reinterpret it as a level set, this is how you do it. And you can see it right here. You can see I this I am currently, initially I should say, viewing my uh, my uh, surface or whatever this is, my my object in question. I'm viewing it as a graph, and specifically it's a graph of this function right here. That's what a graph is. A graph is you value the function equal to a new variable. And I'm reinterpreting it now as a level set. Right? That's what a level set is. Something's a level set if you're setting a function equal to a constant. Notice that it is this function that I can view this as being a level set of. So very importantly, uh, <clears throat> every graph is a level set, but a critical detail, every graph of one function is a level set of a different function. Cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, this function here that I have in green, this function that I have over here in blue, these are different functions. Um, and this is what this little trick, this little what I have in purple, this underwhelming, seemingly triviality of algebra there is how I translate viewing something as a graph into viewing it as being a level set. Let's see this in practice. Um, here again is the underwhelming algebra. Again, yawn, right? Hardly anything happened there. I just subtracted a couple things over. My gosh, this is basically a triviality, right? But notice uh, I am interpreting, I am changing, excuse me, uh, whereas this came to me as a graph, graph of that function right there, I am now reinterpreting this as a level set uh, oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, level set of now this new function. And so once we know the calculus of level sets, which, by the way, is very powerful. Some really cool tricks, really cool uh, tools that we can use there. I can apply the calculus of level sets to this function instead of applying the calculus of graphs to this function, which maybe for whatever reason, I, I maybe the calculus of graphs just isn't particularly helpful. So this turns one kind of a question into a different kind of a question. Okay. All right, neat trick. Heads up, you're going to be using that. Uh, always be on the lookout, as with all the tools in your toolbox. Um, uh, bad news, not every level set is a graph. It doesn't go the other way. Uh, easy counterexample. Um, Here's a level set, and it looks like this, and it's just not a graph. I can't solve for y as a function of x. If I if I tried to solve for y as a function of x, um, I would uh, I'd get two different values of y for the same value of x. Losing. Even if you go the other way, right? If I try to solve for x as a function of y, now I'm going to get two different values of x then for any given value of y. So this is a level set. You can use the calculus of level sets uh, applied to uh, to this function. This is not a graph. You can't use the calculus of graphs here. Okay. All 
Alrighty. So uh, now we're going to uh, talk about a little bit of geometry of three dimensions. Um, there's a broad category of questions of, uh, you know, here's, a, here's an equation involving three variables. What is it? What does it look like? And uh, there's a couple of really powerful tricks here that I want to talk about uh, quickly, I guess. Um, so one is to recognize that in certain cases, this comes up surprisingly often, but in certain cases, your surface is rotationally symmetric. And if you know that your surface is rotationally symmetric, that's a tremendous foot in the door for figuring out what that thing actually looks like. And I'm going to show you an example momentarily. Uh, so uh, how would I draw this conclusion? And here's the neat fact. If your equation involves x's and y's only as part of this expression right there, no other x's or y's in the equation, only as part of square root of x squared plus y squared. Then your surface is rotationally symmetric around the z-axis, and again, tremendous foot in the door. Example to follow. Now let me try to persuade you first that this is true. Uh, the easy way to see this, I don't know, I, I, case could be made, I think the easiest way to see it is... If this is the only way x's and y's shows up, then think about how the cylindrical equation would be formed. If I were to take that equation where that's the only way x and y show up, uh, there's not going to be any thetas in my resulting equation. Yeah. Is this an if and only if? One more time. Is this an if and only if? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, oh, I mean, roughly, I'm, uh, I, I have not thought of that question before, and I'm always scared that there might be uh, some weird, obscure counterexample that I haven't thought of. Roughly speaking, yeah, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a crisper answer later. Yeah. Um, I'll, certainly, I can say this. Um, if a surface is rotationally symmetric around the z-axis, then its equation can be written with no other x's and y's. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Um, yeah. So you think about how the tra translation to cylindrical coordinates would work. You wouldn't have any thetas, and we've already talked about it. if there's no thetas in the equation, then theta doesn't matter. That means it looks the same in all directions, and that means it's rotationally symmetric. So I think that's a pretty persuasive, uh, pretty easy little argument to make. I also like to point out that if you have some point, and if you're, um, uh, you know, let's imagine uh, a scenario where I take that point and I rotate it around. Like so, will these two points, they have the same value of square root of x squared plus y squared because after all, that's just distance to the z-axis. Blue was produced from purple just by rotating it around a little bit. The axis, uh, excuse me, that distance to the z-axis is going to be the same, therefore. So they're going to have the same value of x squared plus y squared. They're going to have the same value of z. Again, that's how rotations work. And if our equation only looks at, right, if our equation only looks at these two things, then those two points are either going to both work or they're going to both fail. And so said differently, um, rotations don't affect that equation Therefore, the surface is rotationally symmetric. So it's a different point of view, different way to think about it. Um, pick your favorite. So let's put this into action. Um, <clears throat> the big, uh, the big, act, the big uh, trick here is if you have a rotationally symmetric surface, then you can just look at its cross section in an appropriate plane. We'll talk about that in a second, and then rotate that cross section around. Let's see it in action. Okay, uh, y'all will recognize this equation right here. Uh, we were uh, uh, looking at that equation uh, a few minutes ago. We were talking about graphs and level sets and stuff like that. Um, so uh, there it is. Um, what is that? What does that look like? And how do I know? And you can turn this into a hard 
art problem if you're not careful. A lot of people like to say, well, let's take cross sections in different directions and we can identify that those cross sections are parabolas and think about how these parabolas and those parabolas would kind of fit together. It, it gets kind of artistically hairy if you think about it that way. So I think it's much better to observe the following. First, X and Y appear only in the special form. Now, if you quibble and say, uh, what happened to the square root, then I'll just point out that I can rewrite this as square root of x squared plus y squared quantity squared. So I win, right? So x and y appear only in that special form, and that's okay. Is that cool? Okay, so we've got a rotationally symmetric thing. I'm now going to take the cross section. Oh, uh, let's see here. Rotationally symmetric around that ax uh, that axis. Now I'm going to consider this plane. That's the yz plane, otherwise known as x equals zero. And a quick geometric appeal, if I can figure out what the cross section looks like in that plane, and I know that my surface is rotationally symmetric, I can just then rotate that cross section around the z-axis and that will produce my picture. All right, again, that's just a geometric appeal. Okay, well, what is this cross section? What do I get when I take my original surface and if I plug in x equals zero, well, that's an easy little bit of algebra. Uh, that turns my equation into this, which is easy. Z equals y squared high school algebra, right? That's a, clearly a parabola, which I can draw effortlessly like so. And then, uh, again, game over. I, I know my thing is rotationally symmetric. I know that's one of the cross sections in a plane containing the axis. You rotate it around, and that then produces that picture. And there you go. So geometrically, artistically, much less challenging than thinking about all of the different cross sections and trying to visualize how those cross sections all fit together. Here I only had to look at one cross section. One of the easiest cross sections. That's it. Okay, I'm a big fan. Uh, by the way, a little bit of terminology. You do, unfortunately, have to know these terms. Uh, this is called a paraboloid. Um, likewise, this one here is called a hyperboloid. Uh, looks like uh, this. Uh, I'm going to let you all think through the details of this one. Um, I, uh, you, you're going to notice a couple of quickie things. X and Y appear only in a special form. Um, I'm choosing a different plane containing the z-axis to rotate or to, to cross section and then rotate. Doesn't matter. Pick your favorite plane. I always like to pick a coordinate plane, right? Because obviously, because it's easier, and we like it when life is easy. And so, you know, be kind to yourself, right? Different equation then to to plug in. And then you're going to have to remember some different high school algebra. I hope you all all remember your hyperboloids. I know it's been a while. Uh, if you're anything like I was when I was in high school, I always found that confusing. Which way does it go? So make sure you get that all straightened out in your head as, you know, again, tragically, sadly, something you just have to straighten out. And uh, that gives you this, and then you can then think about how that rotates around the z-axis to produce as I claim this. Okay, I guess I accidentally did it <laughs> with y'all. Anyway, but I did that quickly, and I left out details. Make sure to fill in those details. Make sure you're good with uh, all of that. Uh, this next example, I just want to point out something very analogous. Um, <clears throat> so there are analogous theorems for... Uh, symmetry rotation arguments around the other axes. And, and now this is something, again, you have to kind of think through. Um, and it's totally analogous to the arguments we just made going around the z-axis. But check this one out. Uh, here, y and z appear only in the special form. Right? So good news 
there. And I claim that that means that we have a rotational symmetry around the x-axis. Again, you got to think that through. Why, you know, so uh, make this kind of an argument, but around the x-axis instead of the z-axis. Your picture is going to be a little different, but the argument is morally equivalent. Um, so again, now you get to pick your favorite uh, plane containing the x-axis. I'm going to choose that one. But again, free country, if you wanted to uh, use that plane instead, that's cool, you know, go whatever, your preference. Any plane containing the rotation axis. Um, again, let's stick with this one, which has that equation, which I can then plug into my original equation. Which, oh, whoops, ah, colors, uh, which turns into that, which again is a hyperbola. Again, flashbacks to high school. Make sure you get that all straightened out. It's that hyperbola. And now when you, uh, geometric appeal, when you uh, rotate that hyperbola in the xy plane, you rotate that around the x-axis, uh, geometric appeal uh, this is hard to draw, but <laughs> you get these kind of, uh, I like to call these contact lenses. I don't know, that's what I see. Um, something kind of like that. It's a, another way you could view this, like a cereal bowl and another cereal bowl that are on their sides that are kind of with their backs to each other, or with their, with their bottoms to, toward each other. Not touching, but, you know, facing toward. Anyway also called a hyperboloid uh, but because it's geometrically different from the one above. This is a hyperboloid of two sheets, we call it. And it looks like I am out of time. So this is a pretty good place to stop for today. And we will pick up here on tomorrow. See you all later. Have a good one.